Uh, when I was a child growing up, every summer the wonderful atmosphere was dampened by the threat of polio. Newspapers and magazines displayed photos of its destruction. At the local movie house, the newsreels show pictures and clips of children struggling with their crutches, children entombed in eye effectiveness of Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. When a waiting world learned on April 12, 1955, that Salk's vaccine had been a success, he became an overnight hero, nationwide, worldwide actually. I often wondered over the years, what happened to Jonas Salk? Having reached a claim at age 40, what did he do for an encore? I tried to find a biography of him, but uh, there were only children's biographies, so I set out to write one. I spent 10 years researching his extensive archives at UC San Diego and the March of Dimes Foundation and interviewing over 100 people. And here's what I found. Can people hear me in the back? Am I okay? Okay. Because there's no speaker. <coughs> Um, Jonas Salk was born on October 28, 1914, in East Harlem. His mother told him he was born with a call, that's an amniotic membrane over his face, and that that meant that he was destined for greatness, fairly unlikely for this shy, submissive, first-generation Jewish immigrant. But he believed her, and he prayed every night that he someday would perform a noble deed. He tried very hard to succeed in high school, hence this picture in the yearbook that had a caption under it, Mr. Big Shot. <laughs> Fresh out of medical training, Jonas and his new wife, Donna Lindsay, moved to Ann Arbor. There he went to work with a very famous virologist, Thomas Francis. Pearl Harbor had just been hit, and the United States had joined the war just as there was a threat up to the troops of an influenza <clears throat> epidemic. This brought back terrible memories of 1918, the great Spanish flu pandemic, when millions died here around the world, and almost as many young men died from influenza as died in the war. So in record time, Francis and Salk concocted and tested the very first effective influenza vaccine, for which Salk did not get much credit. He felt stymied by Francis as time went on and moved to the University of Pittsburgh where he set out to make a universal influenza vaccine. But again, he got discouraged with the politics of science. And when the director of research for the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, Harry Weaver, asked him to join the fight against polio, he agreed. Basil O'Connor, who was a very uh, strong director of the National Foundation had appointed a group of senior polio scientists to help him plan the approach to polio prevention. And among them was Albert Sabin that you see on the left. Sabin was content to have young Salk do some of the tedious tasks, such as uh, determine the number of different types of, of polio virus. But little did he know that under this, this feigned complacency lurked a renegade researcher who made in secret and tested in secret the first polio vaccine behind the back of the strong committee while they were busy arguing about what was the optimal approach to polio. Now there are two remarkable things about this vaccine. First, at the time all the senior scientists in the scientific community believed that the only way to prevent disease was through the vaccine made with a live virus as had been the case in smallpox or yellow fever. Salk believed that you could make a vaccine with a killed virus that would be safe and just as effective. The second was that Salk and just a handful of research associates concocted this vaccine within three months. There was nobody like him in those days, said Harry Weaver, the director of research. His approach was entirely different from that which had dominated the field. He wanted to leap, not crawl. His willingness to shoot the works was made to order for us. So over the objection of the senior scientists, the National Foundation conducted the trial of Salk's vaccine in what would be one of the largest clinical trials in history, conducted solely in children and carried out with funds and by the public through the March of Dimes. On April 12, 1955, when the world learned that this uh, was an effective vaccine, 
there was worldwide celebration. People, people thought it was like the end of a war. Well, what followed that kind of surprised me. <clears throat> Jonas Salk, whose smile shone from every newspaper and magazine around the world, even in postage stamps, did not live happily ever after. On April 12, 1955, his life changed forever, and he suffered a great deal of pain from his fame. That night, Edward R. Murrow had said to him, young man, a great tragedy has just befallen you. You have lost your anonymity. Well, it didn't take Salk long to find out that that was the case. Within a month of his vaccine, uh, there were, uh, to him or to the University of Pittsburgh on his half, behalf, 10,000 letters, calls, and telegrams. He, he couldn't walk into a restaurant or a hotel without causing a stir like a movie star. And looking back years later, he said to a journalist, it's as if I've been public property ever since. It's brought me enormous gratification, opened many opportunities, but at the same time placed many burdens on me. It altered my career, my relationships with colleagues. I am a public figure, no longer one of them. So while the public rushed to honor Salk, the scientific community, the one group whose adulation he craved, remained ominously silent. Well, what was the cause of their rebuke? First, this young scientist, who was not a member of the elite scientific brotherhood, had made a vaccine and tested it behind their backs while challenging one of their long-held principles that only a live virus would make a vaccine that could prevent disease. Second, they accused him of grabbing the limelight and not even mentioning all the other scientists whose work had led up to the vaccine. Now, that in case was not true, but the media and the public made Jonas Salk an icon of the polio saga. They did not want to hear about any other scientists. They wanted to hear about Jonas Salk. <coughs> well, he received numerous honors from heads of states around the world. This is him receiving the presidential citation. He got the Nehru Award. He was elected into the French Legion of Honor, and on and on and on. But he never received the Nobel Prize. He was nominated many times. But the committee said that his work was not prize-worthy. Perhaps even more egregious, he wasn't even invited into the National Academy of Sciences. They said that his uh, work was uh, similar to uh, a director of, of uh, project development for a pharmaceutical firm. Uh, uh, and in fact, Albert Sabin called his work kitchen chemistry. He said, oh, you could go into a kitchen and do what Jonas Salk did. <coughs> Well, now, Saul contributed a little bit to this rebuke himself. He was not a, a traditional scientist, uh, for one thing. And the second, he reached out to the public in ways that no scientist, save maybe Pasteur, a physician scientist, had ever done. And so in doing that, the scientific community had accused him of kind of pandering uh, to the media. Well, Salk did accrue more celebrity than almost any science again, say, scientists save uh, Pasteur in the field of medicine. And so one of his friends said, well, let's not discount envy. Envy is enormous in the field of science. Four years after the Salk vaccine was released, um, the, the amount or the incidence of paralytic polio had been reduced by 90% in the United States. But still, the senior scientists believed that was just a stopgap, and that, in fact, they needed a vaccine made from a live virus. And Albert Sabin was the one to do it, testing its safety and efficacy in Russia. In the early 1960s, the Public Health Service replaced the Salk vaccine with the Sabin vaccine, citing uh, convenience and cost, because this could be given in a sugar cube. Jonas Salk was horrified. He was afraid that a live virus could revert to a more virulent form and actually cause polio. The vaccine caused polio. But the major medical decision makers in the United States turned a deaf ear. And in fact, by 1968, Salk's vaccine was no longer made in the United States. Exhausted Salk sought refuge. He had always dreamed of combining humanists side by side with scientists in an institute. As he said, imbuing the sciences with the conscience of man. 
And with funds from the National Foundation, he hired Louis Kahn, who constructed or designed and constructed uh, an absolutely architectural masterpiece, the Salk Institute, that sits on a bluff in La Jolla overlooking the ocean. There, Salk was able to attract absolutely stellar humanists and scientists, promising them lifetime funding and total autonomy. But it did not turn out to be a refuge for Salk. He faced numerous problems. The maverick architect who spent more time dreaming and drawing, his own inept administrative skills that left the, arch the institute teetering on the brink of bankruptcy repeatedly, a later president who said he could raise more money with Salk dead than alive, and eventually disposal by the very scientists for whom he had created this Shangri-La. He said he felt like a pariah in his own home. Later in life at the Salk Institute, science totally dominated and there was only a threat of humanity. Salk said, it's only half my dream, the biology half of my dream. The humanity half of my dream has not been fulfilled, so I am only half happy. In the meantime, Salk began returning to his laboratory and the public kept saying, what's next, what's mm -hmm. next? Well, the answer Salk got was a little confusing to most. He said he was setting out to harness the immune system. Now that meant approaching two very disparate diseases, cancer in which the immune system failed and multiple sclerosis in which the immune system destroys normal, normal nerve tissue. Well, his work in, po in uh, cancer uh, really demonstrated his lack of facility with modern molecular biology. And the scientists at the Salk Institute uh, really connived to shut down his laboratory. His multiple sclerosis work was more credible and he had come up with a therapy that looked like it was going to be effective, but he hit a blind alley when all the patients developed severe allergic reactions and he ended up abandoning that field. Salk's work defined him, leaving little time for his three sons and wife. Media pictures such as this one displayed him flying a kite with his family, going to a barbecue, but in fact those things rarely happened. His three sons, when they were teenagers, were sent east to boarding schools. Perhaps worse than having a legendary father was becoming a celebrity by association. His wife could never adapt to that celebrity and their marriage ended in divorce. A few, this just shows their celebrity. Not going. There it is. A few years later, Salk met and married Francois Gillot, the French artist whose very popular book, Life with Picasso, detailed her affair as Picasso's mistress. Well, friends were a little startled by this, even more so when they learned of some of her provisos to which he had agreed, uh, one of which was that she could paint in Paris for six months out of the year. But they all agreed he never looked so happy and healthy. As years went on, however, their relationship seemed a little more intellectual than affectionate, and one friend said, I think Jonas spent more time with his housekeeper, Jose, than he did with his wife. In his later years, uh, Salk uh, turned to his, what he called his night notes. These were, uh, for years, when he woke up in the middle of the night, he wrote down what his thoughts were, and they became the basis for four philosophical books on the uh, place of man in the cosmos. Uh, most of the public did not understand his writings. Uh, they were very circuitous kind of ramblings. And in fact, uh, one of the humanists at the Salk Institute used to refer to him as the prophet. Um, as he got older, Salk had more trouble explaining his philosophical ideas to the public in terms that they could understand. Disappointed, he welcomed anyone who could help interpret his ideas, attracting a number of would-be torchbearers, most of whom were smart, intelligent young women, which somehow lost. In his uh, 80s, uh, 70s, Salk was very concerned about uh, the number of young men who were dying from this mysterious uh, disease, later known as AIDS. And he joined the AIDS arena uh, very early on. Uh, many of the younger scientists kind of smirked, oh, here's an old man tilting at windmills. Uh, others uh, called it a noble effort. When no one was working on a vaccine, uh, Salk, who now was out of the Salk Institute, uh, helped form immune response 
and made a vaccine very similar to his polio vaccine, except this had a little, uh, a little twist to it, and that is it was a therapeutic vaccine that was to be given to young men or anyone once they had the AIDS virus to try to keep it from progressing that long course to full-blown AIDS. His initial trials at USC were actually uh, quite uh, promising early on. In his later years, I don't know what happened to this slide, uh, Salk became a very uh, solitary <laughs> man. Uh, his wife uh, only spent a couple of months out of the year now with him. In fact, she told the reporter, if it weren't for my husband, I wouldn't spend two minutes in La Jolla. His children were very busy with their own lives and didn't have to time for him. And Salt really, really longed to have some special, intimate connection with people, but he just didn't seem to know how. So he kept on working. Uh, he was quite the optimist. He was working to improve world health for children across the world. He was working on a, um, trying to get his vaccine, a new version of it, uh, reinstated, working to get influenza vaccines uh, recommended to the entire public. And he was working on trying to get the FDA to approve his uh, AIDS vaccine when he suddenly died of congestive heart failure on June 28, 1995, at the age of 80. Well, Jonathan Salk, in fact, had many legacies. Uh, four years after his death, in fact, the Sabin vaccine, which had caused a lot of cases of polio, was retracted and replaced with Salk's vaccine. The uh, a major advisory committee uh, advised in, uh, to the Public Health Service in 2010 advised that everyone over the age of six months should get a flu vaccine every year. And no one can contest that the Salk Institute isn't one of the finest scientific institutes in the world. Well, as I set out to write my biography, set out to write my biography of Jonas Salk, I, I'd say the biggest challenge that I faced was trying to portray the subject as accurately as possible. As one biographer said, get behind the legend without destroying the man. Salk himself, when asked uh, what he wanted his biographer to write, said the truth. But that wasn't so easy. After April 12, 1955, Salk created this protective shield which made it very hard to understand the paradoxes and the questions surrounding his life. Um, he, he, was, uh, he was a very difficult person to get to know. But as I studied him more, I realized that he was a lot more complex than the kind of superhero uh, that the public had created. And he was definitely more uh, selfless and more caring uh, than the public image some of the scientific community had projected of a glory-seeking dilettante. Uh, he projected this very calm demeanor to the public while he suffered enormous personal burdens. He, he um, hated conflict, but he was surrounded by controversy no matter where he went. He was a man who wanted desperately to be appreciated, to be part of the group, and yet he held challenge the scientific community within, with just tenacity. So I think, in the end, Jonas Salk was an idealist. His passion to cure the ills of the world enshrined him but isolated him. But in the end, that passion let him rise above all the pain, and I think the world is a better place because of it. Thank you.